line distance learning up to, you know, with the goal of around about 2015. So there's this sense that the UK EU didn't work, but that's seven years ago, roughly a third of the total lifespan of the web in some people's books. Things have moved on. There's expertise out there in, in, in the institutions, and they wanted to uh, find out what was going on out there in, in a very broad sense. But before I talk about that, I wanted to go on to money, okay? Money, clearly, is something that we can only need more of, and it's solved all the problems of humanity. You can see that from the way history works, okay? Now, I can't speak for the government, obviously, but I suspect that in the spending review, we will be getting less rather than more money. That's my sense of it. And in that, because of that, I think any vice chancellor, anybody running an educational institution is going to be looking at doing more online distance learning for a number of straightforward reasons. It makes your education into an export. And also, it's, although it's not cheap, and the task force um, uh, agree with that, it is cheaper than building new buildings. So I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of this stuff because of the current uh, situation. So the report itself... There's a live hard copy of it there for you. The report itself, um, we wrote it earlier in the year. We did it very quickly. It was quite stressful, if I'm honest with you. And we looked at the overall provision of HE level online distance courses um, and also HE and FE. But we also um, interviewed nine different institutions that were doing online distance learning to find out their experience of it. And one of the things that, um, some of the things that we found out are that it's important to improve discoverability so that people can find these courses. It's important to promote successful business models. So the business models were actually the most substantive problem uh, or challenge. And also, the exact way that you have your institution set up to support online distance learning administrati administratively and sort of uh, pedagogically as well. Now, I'm not going to talk about the report directly too much because it comes out in a couple of weeks' time and you'll be able to read it for yourself. But I will go through some numbers because everybody loves graphs and numbers, OK? So what we did was we went to the aggregation service, Education UK. and um, we, It was just a quick way of collecting what was going on and filtering it because we didn't really know what the, what the output of the UK was in terms of online distance learning. And these, we found about, um, I think it's about 424 courses which are broadly online distance, OK, including blended. And we map them against these simple subject areas. And, we, uh, and these are ones directly provided by educational institutions. And you can immediately see a kind of pattern emerging here in terms of level seven courses, postgraduate, professional, uh, in, in these kind of professional subject areas and, and business. Then, oh, I think I've gone to the end of my, this is, this is the talk backwards at 100 miles an hour, OK? If, you if you've got a photographic memory, you can leave now. OK. Then we went to, I like this cartoon from XKCD, it's actually horrifically accurate. We went to the institutional websites to see if we could find more courses um, uh, that they might put on online distance. What we actually found was less courses. We couldn't find courses that we'd found in the aggregation service because the websites were so poor. So we know that there's a job of work to be done there in terms of institutional websites. And, and I think a body like GIST can get involved in that. That's a straightforward thing that we need to improve, because if you can't find it in Google, it doesn't exist. That's a bit of a strong statement, obviously. Then we went and had a look at private partnerships. Uh, so these are, these are, these are the par partnerships with, with um, educational institutions uh, that are working on a commercial basis. And we found about, uh, I think we found about 170 courses. And you can immediately see how skewed that is, OK? Almost all of it is in business. A little bit broader in terms of level and a few other subjects as well. So we've got a very particular picture here of level seven courses. This is what, this is what UKHE looks like to the world. It looks like level seven courses that are in professional areas. And there's a good reason for that, obviously. You need the flexibility of online distance learning if you're in full-time work. And there's a natural kind of income stream there if you're in one of these kind of higher level sort of jobs. So that immediately brings us, I mean, you're probably all thinking this. Are we progressing towards a kind of situation whereby we have the danger of producing, you know, this kind of digital diploma mills idea? And I like this tweet that was on um, behalf of uh, John Traxler the other day. Is industrialization an analogy or a description of e-learning in higher education? And there's a sense out there that technology and e-learning is there to make things more efficient and to help scale things up, 
Okay, we're going to use technology. It's the big other that's going to solve all our problems, and we're going to be able to go big, and it's going to solve all of these economic tensions. It's not quite as simple as that. And here's the reason. These are some of the quotes that came out of the, uh, some of our uh, interviews, okay? Um, if you have more than about 20 or 30 people to a tutor in terms of ratio on online distance courses, people just start dropping out. And we know this. And we found this to be true across all of the people that were doing this stuff. Even the private partnership we interviewed almost disappointingly said, we can't find a way of scaling this beyond these kind of numbers. Okay? So we're not going to see that kind of massive factory industrialization of online distance learning. It can't scale like that because the students need and expect contact. Okay? Now, I think that um, the edges of universities are obviously quite permeable now. And last year we saw that report come out of Demos called the Edgeless University. And that permeability goes both ways, okay? So we're putting online distance courses out there. Um, we're also putting open educational resources out there. We're filling up iTunes U. So we've got some flow in that direction. I think what's coming in to universities is not necessarily an expectation of a particular sort of types of platform or technology are going to be provided. I don't think students expect their course to be in Facebook. That's not what they look to the institutions to do. But I think what's happened out on the web is that social media has created this expectation of a particular form of engagement. And it's that form of engagement, that cultural expectation, that people are bringing into university. That's what they want. Okay? So you could argue that social media is a good thing on the one hand because it, gets, it helps solve the problem of the atomization of society, of not knowing who your neighbor is, of um, the problem of you know, bowling alone. Okay? So you can have distributed peer networks Ge geographically distributed, and they can, they can come together using social media. That's probably a good thing. It's not very utopian because of the problem of homophily, obviously. But on the other hand, um, I think what's happened because of the uh, business model of social media, they want you to, to go to their site little and often. They want you to post little and often. They want your eyeballs as often as possible. And I think what's happening with social media is that it's atomized self-esteem and motivation. Okay? So... We've got, we need to be fed these tiny little pellets of self-esteem and motivation very, very often, okay? Because, and I think that that's the expectation that a lot of students come to university with, and it's very important in terms of online distance learning. So we need multiple points of feedback. We need a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning and a lot of contact, uh, contact with the tutor. And the people who were doing this stuff successfully were finding ways of having those multiple points of contact. Now... Just coming back on the keynote yesterday morning, which has been the subject of a number of talks, um, the lecture, let's think about the lecture, okay, this situation here. Now, let's, let's not think about it from the point of view of, of pedagogically. Let's think about it in terms of, because, you know, knowledge transfer, the rights and the wrongs of the lecture, et cetera, et cetera. We won't go into that. Let's think about it in terms of eventedness, of presence, of fellowship, okay? Personally, I think that the lecture is a very, very efficient way of helping students feel like they're part of something. And students need to feel like they're part of something. Very important online distance learning. In the face-to-face -face institution, the lecture functions reasonably well in that way. Okay? So um, what I want to do is just a little experiment. Without looking, I want you to think about the people that are sat next to you. What are they thinking? You can sort of feel their presence. Are they particularly attractive? Hands up if you're sat next to a particularly attractive... No, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> so I think that this is a broad challenge, this expectation of contact, contact. We used to talk about content, and then somebody invented Wikipedia. We talk about context, context quite a lot. I think contact is a challenge for e-learning, and I think it's a challenge for the face-to-face -face institution as well. And as I say, this, this granularization of, of self-esteem and motivation is a little bit like, and here's my snack-based metaphor... <laughs> Social media is very much like Pringles, okay? This is a visual prop, so you remember it. I actually, I actually opened it, so I've eaten about half of them. I, I managed to stop somehow. Um, did you know that Pringles, are, the flavor is chemically engineered so that when you eat the first one, you get a massive hit of flavor, and it fades off very quickly. So you want to eat another one. But when you eat the second one, your, your tongue's slightly satiated, so you need to eat a third one. 
and you have to go on and on. You have to eat more and more to keep the flavor level up. And I think in some ways, in terms of contact, motivation, and self-esteem, social media is a little bit like that with the, with, the, with the little and often. And I think that that's causing a kind of cultural challenge within universities. And as I say, this is quite broad. I, I, like, the, I like these statistics that come from Australia. There's no such thing, obviously, as, as the traditional face-to-face -face student, although we do tend to put online distance learning in the context of some sort of mythical face-to-face -face student. In actual fact, a face-to-face -face student is spending an increasing amount of time online, and I like that second stat there, you know, it's difficult because of the scale of the thing for them to feel that they know a lecturer or that a lecturer knows them. So again, there's that challenge. There's that contact challenge. This is a quote that comes out of the study. And uh, for if, if, when you read it through, I think what's at the heart of it is, is it an academic's responsibility to have the students come to them? Or is it their responsibility to, for the academic to go out to the students? Now, I think because of what's been happening on the web, there's, there's an expectation that you go to the students. And that, rather than any kind of technological challenge, that is the, 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 the problem that we're trying to solve in terms of moving this area forward, is how to go about doing that and work, at, and work with quite large numbers. OK, a couple of other things that have come out of the kind of task force area. These are quotes that have come out of the task force, and I, I'm not really critiquing them because they're broadly held views. But we know that the top one isn't really true. And even if students do live and breathe Web 2.0, we don't actually know what that might mean for their education. It's not clear what that might mean. And then the second quote, um, it's, there's, a there's a big difference between the idea of ability and willingness. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but anybody who knows my visitor and residence stuff, there's a link there. You'll, you'll know what I think about that. Um, underlying this is this sense that if everybody could just get a bit better with the technology, get their heads around the new stuff, then things would become much more efficient, the world would be just a much happier and better place, it would all start working, okay? That's the sense of it. Oh, now you might sit there and say, but I, that's fine, you might sit there and say, I'm not a technological determinist, I'm learner first, pedagogy first, and I use the technology like a tool to, to help facilitate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But let me just show you this image. How many of you want one of those? OK. Yeah, people are actually putting their hands up. Lovely. <laughs> and why do you want that? Is it because of what it does? Or is it because it's really, really thin? <laughs> I really want one of those. Um, that's fake, by the way. I'm sorry to have to. That's a fake image. So just looking at that kind of area more broadly, there's, you know, there's a kind of ideological underpinning to this idea that we're moving towards this global knowledge economy, this flat world, okay? And I think that because um, ed tech, the ed tech role and e-learning is becoming increasingly mainstream, and because of the funding situation will become more so, it's important that we consider where we sit relative to these kind of larger issues. I quite like the idea of a future that has knitted robots in it. You know, that might happen. It's unlikely, though. Um, another way of putting it is this. That's ironic, by the way. I just thought that was a fun tweet, okay? But I think sometimes implicit in the way that we act is that sense that, you know, hey, if you don't get this stuff, then no wonder, you, you know, if you're not on board, then you're just way out of it. This is the only way to go. Okay. Quiz time, right? And I couldn't find miniature packs of Pringles, so I've got... You have the opportunity to win some mini cheddars, which I will throw at you, Okay. So I'm using a very basic te pedagogical technique here, which is if you don't pay attention, there's a mild threat of violence. If you do pay attention, you might get a snack, all right? So let's just have a look at some of the people uh, that have been sort of promoting this kind, th this kind of ideological, uh, particular ideology. Okay, Tony Blair, what did, what did he study? What was his main course? Law. Well, hands up, come on. Law, okay, yeah. <laughs> oh, I couldn't get it far enough. I'm going to have to come down to the front. OK. Hands up. I want to see hands up. OK. You're nice and close to the front. So, so far, um, economically useless subjects, OK? What about the remote participants? Well, if you could sort out some cheesy snacks via Illuminate, then go ahead. Be my guest. OK, this one's, more, this one's more difficult. So you, get, you have to do both of these, OK? Hands up, and you get a transformer snack, which is pretty good. You can make yourself a maze-based car, yes? 
What did you say? Yeah, but what about the other one? Yeah. Not German, no. No. What? No. Right, you've taken too long. I get these. I get to keep these. Okay, the answer is PPE and social anthropology. And at the moment, there are seven people in the cabinet that did PPE at Oxford, uh, which has got philosophy in the middle of it. So while there's this massive promotion of STEM subjects, the people who actually run the country did useless things like philosophy, which I find intriguing. And there's a really nice quote here from the Times Higher from a guy that helps run that course. And they said, why has everybody come to Oxford to do PPE? And he goes, nah, it's how the class system works, which I thought was a great response from somebody who's supposed to run PPE. There's one more person, who, a, a very famous politician, who didn't do a useless subject. Can you, anybody tell me? What did she do? Chemistry. Chemistry, absolutely. So she did something, she actually did something useful. Um, that's a bit of a cheap shot, I suppose. Um, so what, is, what, what does this actually mean? Okay, that's the end of snack time, people. I'm sorry if you didn't get any. I've got a couple of bags left if you want to see me afterwards. Um, sorry about that. Uh, and half a tub of Pringles. I think that, that what's going to happen is we're going to end up in a situation whereby there's going to be this divide between, and there already is obviously, between these economically viable courses and those who can afford to do things like arts and humanities. And I think that also there's going to be uh, a divide based on how the institutions work, based on mode of delivery. So those who can afford it will, will, will go face to face, and those who can't might end up doing it online. And we need to be very careful in, in, our, um, in our community that we don't end up in that situation where online distance learning becomes just postgraduate professional STEM MBA type subjects. Now, I've got no problem with those subjects at all. I think they're brilliant. I think they're excellent. We should do lots of them. It's what we're not doing that worries me slightly. And again, this came out this morning. Um, you know, there's this, there's this sense that, they'll, that, that you'll have less social mobility if you don't get that full um, university experience, that full face-to-face -face experience. So these kind of reports are situating online distance learning as a second-class mechanism. Whereas personally, I think, because of the way that um, lectures work, face-to-face -face lectures work, I think you've got the, there's a chance that there'll be, you'll have more contact with your peers and your tutors when you're doing online distance learning, if it's well-designed, than you would at a traditional face-to-face -face course. So we need to be careful to defend that area and not end up looking like the kind of return on investment option. And it doesn't have to be like that. One of the people that we um, interviewed during the, uh, uh, the report, putting the report together, was the Sheffield College, very interesting further education college that does HE and FE. And they do uh, online distance courses all the way through from pre-GCSE all the way through to a BA, all online distance. And it's an absolutely fantastic opportunity for people who want to um, just, if you like, raise their educational capital, really get stuck into education. So there are people, and it's a, it's a real minority, who are working, thanks, who are working at kind of the other end of the spectrum. And I wonder where, how well that's going to get in supported. So we're looking at social return on investment rather than return on investment, okay? Uh, what was the other, the other phrase was uh, along the lines of um, HE should enrich society, not make society rich. There's another little meme. But my favorite one that came out of a session on Monday was, we're talking learning, not earning, which I liked. It was nice and kitsch. <laughs> um, so these are my thoughts. These aren't, these, aren't, these aren't specifically in the report, and they're not the task force's um, thoughts necessarily. They report later. Um, I think that perhaps those professional postgraduate courses should operate largely Within, within market forces. They should survive within that environment. I think that's fair. I think it's important that, that, that courses that are outside of the business sort of STEM area, um, the ones that don't have an obvious immediate return on investment, get support. And personally, I think that that's what a government should do with regards to education. They should be there to fund things that don't work necessarily directly as part of the larger economic model. I think the role of the ed tech needs to, to evolve because um, over the next decade or so, it's, going, it's not going to be the science of the internet. It's going to be the social science of the internet that's going to be the real challenge and how we engage with that. And I think as ed techs, we need to continue to move that way. And we have, I mean, I've seen the character of alt change over the years to, in that direction, and I think that's a really good thing. So just to finish up on the, kind of on, on, on the stuff about the report, um, we talk about digital identity quite a lot. We talk about it for individuals, so whether that's students or staff. But when we're talking about online distance learning 
uh, across the UK, then we need to be thinking about what is the digital identity? How are we presenting UK HE out there globally? And at the moment, it has a very particular character. And I'm not sure that that character is, is, I'm not sure we're properly reflecting the character of what we do out there, okay? And, I, you know, I, I think it, it would be good if that could change. I don't know what, what would make that change, but I'd like to see it change. And for yourselves in your own particular institution, what's the online, what's the digital identity of your own personal institution rather than yourself, rather than your Twitter feed? And what can you do to influence that? You might feel like you can't do anything to influence it. You might feel you, might feel you can. But as I say, I think that increasingly, those of us that work in educational technology will actually be able to influence things like the digital identity of our own institutions. And I think it's worth standing back and considering what that might be. So the report comes out in a couple of weeks' time. You can read that for yourself. If you want to talk to me about the sort of more about the nitty-gritty of the report and some of the details, then come down and talk to me afterwards or at lunch. I'm very happy to talk to you about that further. Um, if you're interested in these kind of more these kind of broader topic areas in terms of the role of technology within education and how that relates to what's happening out there, we're going to try and convene a series of seminars. And if you're interested in that, then um, follow that link and, and just let us know if you're interested. And that's me. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks very much indeed, Dave. Um, you've thrown a few things at you, um, physically as well as in terms of ideas. Uh, we have about ten minutes for questions. And we have roving mics around. Um, I'll take the uh, top and one down here, please. Hi, Dave. It's uh, Mark Johnson from the University of Bolton. I was very interested in your thoughts at the end of that, and the phrase that um, crossed my mind is, is public service education, in the same way that we have public service broadcasting to try and balance out the provision of the market, the, the, what, what can su uh, survive in the uh, free market with something which, is, uh, which balances things out. Um, but also, I think education as a service to society is something which has not really been high on the agenda, both of the previous government and of the current government. There seems to be a prevailing view that education is a series of competing businesses. And um, I don't know how you see this panning out, but, but certainly my vice chancellor sees himself as the chief, chief executive of a business. Yeah, I mean, I think what I'd like to see happen in that area, and I've got no right to say it apart from the fact that I happen to be stood here today, is within each individual institution, I think that vice chancellors should, if you like, top slice the kind of profits that come off these, these very successful, you know, like online distance, if, if postgraduate professional things, and uh, top slice them. And th I think they have a responsibility to feed some of that money back into the areas that might struggle. Okay, so if, if, if you like, it's, it's, a kind of, um, it's a kind of arts and humanities tax for the good of society. I mean, that's what I'd like to see happen, and I do think that, that, that universities certainly, as institutions, have, have a responsibility to do that, so that they remain something that, as I say, enriches society, rather than simply becomes just, an, just the next, just one step in an economic cycle, where uh, those who can't afford, to, um, can't afford to do the course of their choice have to do something that gets them a good job, and, and that, that worries me, especially as the people who are telling us that did PPE, which is, as I say, hypothetically a useless um, subject. <laughs> Only hypothetically. I'm not trying to. Um, I, think, I think the tenor of what you're saying, sorry, Helen Lutham, I think the tenor of what you're saying, what I'm getting is that we should be asserting that education and knowledge and research are a public good rather than a private good. Yeah. And I think, it, I think we need to say that really clearly. I mean, at this stage in the history of higher education. Yes, now's the time to start saying that. Now's the time that. to say that, absolutely. Yeah. So it's great to hear it kind of being said, and say, please say it very clearly. But um, I'm wondering if the edgeless university then means that um, through that sort of leaky boundary, the university and what it offers gets sucked into the logic of the market and the commercialised internet, or whether there's now an opportunity to assert some of the values of the academy and of knowledge research and of research um, in a way that have renewed relevance in an era of digital knowledge. And I think we can assert those values. I think they do have renewed relevance. But I'd ask you what you think the values 
are that we should assert that can begin to have some influence and perhaps reposition universities as sites of public knowledge, which is what we need to do? Well, I, I think what I'd say is that we're talking about well-being and we're talking about value in a non-economic sense. And um, I, I think that, that um, universities have a responsibility to give people a broad enough education, whether it's through that, that kind of uh, membrane at the edge of them or whether it's in them centrally. They have this responsibility to give people a broad enough education that they understand that there's, there's, there, there, there's, there's more depth to life than necessarily just earning lots of money. And at the moment, the message is that, you, that to be... And I, this is a quote that I heard on the Today programme. It was um, you, um, that they might be considering raising the retirement age so that you can be a useful member of society for longer. Now, if you take that apart, that's quite a scary ideology, okay? Which, which is basically saying, unless you're earning money, you just, you're just baggage. You're just dragging us down. And so I, I think in answer to your question, I think it's the responsibility of the university to, to counter exactly that kind of ideology. And as you say, we can take advantage of the fact that we can throw things out there now and that, we, that we're not totally closed units. And I'd like to see more of that happen. I'm not saying that's not happening. I'm just saying when you, when you look at a broad snapshot, you don't, you don't really see it. OK, thank you. Um, I'll take one from uh, Illuminate from Kath. Query, are we properly preparing students for changes out there? Are we properly preparing students for changes out there? That's a very broad question. Mm. Uh, yes and no. no. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I, th I think one thing that's, that's happening is, 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 and if you look at what employers want, then they, the kind of values that they want are to do with altruism, uh, team, you know, team player, uh, outro, uh, um, uh, values that are more uh, directly associated with the idea of being a good, useful citizen than necessarily being a brilliant professional. And I think that what we're doing, if, if the focus become, has this very professional focus as you go through higher education so that you get a good job, then you're going to end up in the workplace with not necessarily the right skills to really get on and progress and do valuable stuff, which would be good for the economy, which is quite ironic. I think there's, a, there's another problem um, uh, within that as well, which is that if, if everything we do is, is assessed in terms of impact and performance, that's a, that's a bureaucratic process. And obviously, uh, uh, bureaucracies can only assess against what's gone before. Now, if it's important for us to become a, 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 an economy of in, a, a society of innovators, if that's what's good for our economy, then how can we assess that using an administrative process? Because it, if, it's, if it's administrative, if it's innovative, it can't possibly be seen by those kind of processes. It almost it just stands to reason. So I think we've got a problem there. If if things become too performance focused, we're going to. Uh, negate the opportunities for people who really are innovators, who really are bright thinkers as well. So I don't think, I'm, I think in some ways we are missing the opportunity to prepare people, yeah. Okay, thank you. One quick question here. Um, hi, it might not be um, a quick answer, uh -oh. but um, I think my thoughts from your presentation um, is, and, and from talking to academics and potential students and students, is they're going into learning because they want access to networks, whether okay. that's face-to-face um, -face or um, distance learning networks, or whatever. And um, so your point about some of the politicians that haven't done useful subjects is that they certainly got useful networks yeah. and ins, and um, whether that's financial um, advantage to being in a network or not. In, and um, how that is affecting uh, universities. So we've had lots of discussions about they're doing online for profit or for a greater profit and productivity in the business. But um, the, uh, the sort of impact of why people are going uh, is because of the networks and whether the, the online is facilitating um, more fair access to some networks that might have been uh, previously well, yeah and, and I think that that's I think that, that your the point that you're discussing is ref reflected in that report that came out this morning which was just saying you know one of the reasons why so many people do PPE at Oxford is because they meet all the right people so that they can go on to the Houses of Parliament so I think in terms of online distance learning what I think what you say is correct and we have to make sure that our online distance learning does give people access to networks because of the way that it's designed rather than simply trains people how to get through an assessment. 
uh, and uh, getting access to those networks is one of the most valuable things about higher education, other than the life experience, you know, that whole life experience. And if we get too focused on simply doing the course, which is quite often just the focus of online distance learning, then it will become a second rate op option compared with face to face, because you'll get the qualification and you'll have nowhere to go with it because you won't have formed that network of people. And obviously, the way that the technology works in terms of social media, uh, hypothetically, we have technologically the options to really work and expand those networks and provide access to them for our students. So I do think that that's, yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Okay, uh, well, I'll close it there, and I'm sure there'll be opportunity to grab Dave at, at lunchtime. So thank you very much indeed for a, a nice provocative...